red shovel network takes pleasure in bringing you soul of detroit stories from the world's great literature of pure excitement a new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment week by week from the pick of new material from the pages of best-selling novels from the theater of Broadway and London and the sound stages of Hollywood will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. RSN gives you Soul of Detroit. You ass in a rag and you're trying to get out of my face. Gone. What are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You might be qualified, ML. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Albert? Do I want to go? What a question. It's the only one I seem to be answering these days. Do I want to go and run for Detroit City Council? What? We'll talk about Shocking. that in just <laughs> a minute. On ML Soul Detroit. <laughs> I think it's all a ploy so you could have more time on the podcast to talk about yourself, but that's just me. Well, actually, I was hoping we'd spend more time debating what our great debate topic was. <laughs> the debate about what our topic would be, I guarantee right now, will be way better than whatever our de- debate is. So, it was uh, either the president or some sexist topic or what? Some oh, amor- come on. amorphous thing you said. I think it was your word, right? Amorphous? About so, so are politicians? You t- are you telling me you weren't able to contribute because you were looking up the word amorphous? Was that what the that's <laughs> that what the me. awkward silence was? was I don't remember. Was Is there any ever awkward silence when you're in the room? <laughs> well, there's never any silence, oh, so it couldn't okay. be. Was that awkward? Or was that just <laughs> awkward at all? Well, you just, were smiling, and you know. it's it more of a convivial silence. Yeah, you were smiling. But anyways, uh, this 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 witty repartee. <laughs> um, or what passes for it uh, involves uh, Mr. Mark Fellhauer, who is our producer, who enjoyed, I hope, a great holiday. And of course, there's Sean Windsor, who um, enjoyed a good holiday, but was very upset because he knew that when Santa and the and the reindeer got on his roof, some snowflakes died. I, I, I was <laughs> they were thinking crushed. it was you. That was they were, they were melted. I thought you were Santa up there. Not me. Not me. I, Walking around. This is as close to a beard as I can get after 53 years. I'm never going to pass for Santa. But uh, we did have a little a little question on social media, which was, did anybody get the inside joke with our most recent episode with all the new wave music? And I don't think anybody did. Should we tell them what it was? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, because it's riveting. Okay. I don't even remember it. Well, that those two shows were recorded back to back. So when we were talking about what a great Christmas we'd had, we hadn't had Christmas yet. Oh, yeah. That was obvious. Wait a second. We did? Another there snowflake just died. I thought we did a show last week. <laughs> every time, every time Sean lies, AOC dies. I'm not lying. I just, <laughs> I'm just, for, I've just forgotten. I don't know. Well, uh, it was like an hour of new wave music. You know, what do you want me to do? Oh, it's cool. Sounds like he's objecting. No, 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 no. I enjoy it. I have a cot right under here, and I laid down. It was just nice. A little nappy. Okay. Well, that's good. I could use a nap. It's been pretty crazy. Uh, Twenty four hours. Uh, but before we get to what's ahead, we should talk about what's past and as in passed on. Uh, as you know, COVID continues to be a beast that is taking lives. And one of the lives that was lost was Wayne County Sheriff and former Detroit Police Chief, former mayoral candidate, former Wayne County Executive candidate. And at one time, uh, not too long ago, was considered as a potential lieutenant governor candidate. Uh, Mr. Benny Napoleon, and joining us to talk about Benny Napoleon, sharing some of his insights as he did in the Detroit Free Press, is Soul of Detroit contributor, Mr. Darren Nichols. Darren, take it away. D-Nick! Benny Napoleon, our former Detroit police chief, and who was our current Wayne County Sheriff, a man who embodied Detroit, a man who was Detroit, a man who spent his lifetime giving service to Detroit and one who did whatever it took to keep Detroiters safe. For me, it was displayed by a picture that I kept on my laptop computer every day that reminded me of the work that he did. The picture was of Benny Napoleon 
carrying a young girl in his arms as he's running away from a scene down an alleyway in Detroit. And that to me showed not only that he walked the walk, but he talked the talk. That he not only talked about keeping Detroiters safe, but he put a little girl in his arms to make sure that she made it all right in 1989. I had a number of good times around Sheriff Benny Napoleon and they weren't all work related. I remember playing in his golf tournament where he would raise funds for uh, the money that he would give out for gifts at Thanksgiving and at Christmas time. And then I would also run, run upon him on the golf course at Warren Valley on the weekends when I was playing with my dad and his friends and Benny Napoleon would be on the course and we'd pass each other or just say hi at the 19th hole or just, you know, hey, what's going on? Benny Napoleon was was a man that became a trusted friend. He was one that when it came to running for mayor of the city of Detroit, he I was among the people that he asked what people were saying on the streets about him running for mayor. And I was one to tell him that the streets were telling me that he not only was going to run for mayor, but that he was going to be a leader to run for mayor. That necess- that didn't come true, as we all know, but we also know that Benny Napoleon continued to lead this city and Wayne County in a bona fide way. What I also wanted to say about Benny Napoleon was that He was, I believe, the second police chief uh, in Detroit that used their education as a way to ascend in his career. And that was frowned upon him at the time. And that is also what uh, what that picture reminded me of, because he because Benny Napoleon took a lot of flack for getting education to rise up the ranks and was not not as thought upon as a man who worked the streets. And that picture always reminded me that that was not the case. So with that, we say farewell to Benny Napoleon and may you rest in peace. Very well said. Uh, Benny was someone who often showed up on ballots because police chiefs really are politicians. They have to be to succeed, but he never really seemed to enjoy being a candidate. He enjoyed dealing with people, but he didn't have that fire on the belly in the belly to ask people for their votes or for their money. He seemed to prefer being a police officer. And and during his time as a, as a, as a leader of, of law enforcement agencies, he had his challenges. I mean, the Detroit police department was put under, federal oversight while he was Detroit police chief. And there have been problems at the jail. And as, as Benny said himself in many interviews, he was trying to get 200 people hired to work the jails, but he couldn't get people because, uh, because the wages were so poor. And so he struggled with things like that, uh, which a lot of administrators would struggle with. But two things Benny did that I wrote about after he passed that I think uh, people don't understand or appreciate that get lost in the tribute that showed that he was really in some ways very progressive back in at the the turn of the millennium. I know it sounds so long ago now, but in the uh, late nineties, 2000, he ordered Detroit police to have cameras in their cars, which at the time was pretty revolutionary, particularly for a department that barely had computers in their cars. And that was something that we see everywhere now. So he was ahead of the curve on that. And he and I served on a panel at Wayne State University discussing body cameras. Now, a lot of police don't like body cameras. I think those opinions are changing now that we've seen body cameras both expose bad cops and prove that some shootings were justified or some incidents were were defensible. And Benny said, we got to have these cameras. I want to have these cameras. And, And for that, 
police do not like to be watched. And I say that as someone who tries to watch the watchmen. But in those regards, Benny was very enlightened, very forward thinking. And to my mind was someone who could see what was coming and, um, and embraced it. And I think that the reforms that he helped usher into Detroit and Wayne County are the kind of things that are going to bring about better police, safer communities, and, uh, and, uh, and help get police back to a point where they have our respect and appreciation because the good ones deserve it and the bad ones, well, I don't appreciate them and I don't respect them because they don't deserve to be called police. So uh, Benny Napoleon, uh, we wish you well in your next assignment. Final call for Benny Napoleon. Um, it's uh, a big loss. And, uh, and I don't want to get too, too heavy here. Um, we have uh, another one of our contributors, John Rutherford, corner of the Cadu Cafe, leader of the Motor City Horns, and, of course, trombone player for Bob Seeger, who shares with us some, I'm expecting, a little more ribald recollections <laughs> of Alto Reed. John, uh, John had so many stories. That, uh, this is about a quarter of what he sent, uh, sent in. So, uh, But, yeah, as you mentioned, he played with Alto, knew Alto very well. Yeah, and and you know people don't maybe don't understand, but uh, saxophone's a horn, so I don't think he was in the Motor City Horns. But you had two <laughs> two guys who really knew how to blow, and so John, please, <laughs> before somebody makes uh, a joke yeah, out of that, comes to mind, though, take it away. Uh, from the most recent tour was we were in Billings, Montana. We went to see um, I think it was Custer's Custer's Last Stand, and we needed to rent a car, and so we go to the airport. Alto is going to rent the car and pulls out his ID and, you know, it says Alto Reed and the guy's like, no way, no way. You're not Alto Reed. And of course he's like, yeah, I am, you know, and the, his license is expired. So then he wants me to rent the car, but he wants to drive it. It's like, it's like, no way I'm not renting the car. And funny enough too, I, I can take credit for saving his life that night because when we were driving back from our, our excursions, we're on the highway and uh, we had a little bit of a lull in the conversation and I was probably playing on my phone or something and Alto uh, drifted to sleep and I, the car starts to get over into that, that warning zone and like, I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I, I grab the wheel and nudge him, Alto, Alto, wake up. And anyway, he's like, don't ever tell anyone about that. So sorry, Alto. He was always, you know, just living in the moment always living positively too. If you ever felt down, if you were ever worried about something or if you, you, you know, you felt, well, you know, it might snow, maybe this show is going to get canceled or, you know, we're going to get trapped here. We're not going to be able to get to the next city. He would always, don't say it. He would, he would cut you off. Don't say that. Don't say that. Think positive. He's like, I don't, I don't even want to hear it. I don't even want to hear the negativity. He created, um, I'm not sure if he created the persona or if the persona created him, but that of Alto Reed, you know, you open yourself up to, you know, like, who is this guy? Who's this guy wearing sunglasses in the bar at, at 10 o'clock? Or who's this guy? You know, he's always dressed to the nines, typically had cowboy boots on, really nice boots. Um, he always just made sure to, to look good. And he, and he had, he had his unique style. He had this, this, uh, Aura, so to speak, you know, he'd walk into a room and he would just hold court, love telling stories and, and not only love them, but love telling them, but was a great storyteller. The first one that comes to mind is, and, and he, he would do all sorts of animation, uh, and just like hand movement and gestures with his body to, to tell this story. And it's when I think he did it a few times, but he, um, played the national anthem at the, for the Red Wings. And I'm not sure when this particular one was, but I th I, I'm sure it was probably a playoff game or a Stanley Cup game. And and he was a good skater too. And he practiced. He he, he told me how he prepared for 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 these. He practiced for hours and hours. I mean, weeks, months in advance. And uh, I've seen some videos. I mean, he was a great skater. Anyway, he they had this whole routine worked out, and there were of course other people on the on the ice and. Um, Again, being a playoff game, an important game, there were they had flag people and and uh, you know I'm not sure if there was a choir, but you know there's a lot of people on the ice, and so Alto skating around and somehow one of the flag one of the flag guys like runs into him or hits him, and I believe it was while he was playing. I remember that. 
and just to see Alto, the, the, the look on his face as he's telling the story, and he does all the contortions, and I mean, pretty much would fall to the ground when he, when he told the story. Crush the saxophone. Um, I think it's still played, but anyway, he, he got through it. Um, but you know, he, he just, he just lived for, for those moments being in front of people and entertaining and, you know, bringing joy, um, and music to people. Um, but to hear him tell that story, I mean, and I, I heard it, I heard the story many, many times and, and it never got old. And so, but Alto was just really encouraging about, um, our role in the band and then what we were doing outside the band it was just very supportive and, and a mentor to, uh, of sorts to uh, the horns and to many, many musicians around the Detroit area and, and around, the, around the U.S. And so that's the legacy he leaves. Um, so sad to see him go. It was definitely a, a, a big surprise and uh, a sad ending to, to 2020. So I, I, was, I was hoping for some more uh, X-rated stories. I think those will be on a future episode of The Soul of Detroit. But yeah, I mean, what a big horn. Big character. Dude was a showman. I mean, you've seen Seeger Big live, loss. right? Uh, I did see him. In fact, I saw him, I think it was on the ninth to last farewell <laughs> tour um, yeah. in Toledo. I was actually a, a guest of, of John's, Ooh. and uh, it's a nice, uh, a nice smaller venue. So it was really cool to see a big act like that in sort of a smaller oh. place. But, of course, it was still, you know, thousands of seats. Right. I'm shocked, though. You Seager. actually saw a band with a drum kit, <laughs> like a real drum a kit, and not a little synthy, thin, oct what? octagon kind of concoction. You get, if you ever yeah. saw Seeger live, your eyes immediately just go to Alto Reed. I mean, he is the – well, Seeger said it himself. He was the rock star in that band. He was the showman. He was the guy. John, how did you see John's addendum, his text that he sent over about Alto? Uh, you know what? Elto also had a deputy sheriff's badge as well. Yeah, I, I and then saw he that. Used it up. often. Yeah, I'm wondering about. Uh, I was wondering where he got that. I'm wondering which county that is. I think I know, but uh, I'm not gonna. Hey, well, he got it fair and square. I'm sure. Right? No. Huh? I'm not sure how he got it, but I know he probably shouldn't have been flashing it. But it's not unusual for somebody who's got some juice to get a badge and to try and. That was a surprise, uh, get though. So out of some trouble. But like yeah. Shaq, didn't Shaq? Go? Shaq did, yeah, yeah. Shaq. But Shaq so went to the academy, didn't he? I thought he was. I don't know if he put the full full time in the academy, really? but. I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe what, I'm wrong. Weren't I'm he and wrong. Steven Seagal in the same academy class? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What a pair. Oh, boy. Thunder and and loser. Um, <laughs> and Sean, uh, you had your own eulogy. Yeah. Sean, I have to tell break. you. A lot of death over the break, man. What a weird way to start the, the year. Yeah, Sean Sean wrote a tribute to one of the, uh, one of the uh, more dynamic figures, both in Detroit journalism history uh and and elsewhere and it's one of the best written things i've seen under sean's byline and i'm not saying that just because you used a lot of his own writing which was very good thank you there's an old saying about talent uh, uh borrowing and genius stealing i will say you're both yeah, talented a and sentence. a genius i used a sentence or two i read so i said this is beautiful and i noticed it was in quote marks said, oh sean didn't write yeah, this no. but then sean wrote some stuff that was pretty nice but i know how to use quotes i think yeah, because I'm not the only voice in the room. I I, I realize that. And Mark, if we could help somebody else learn that lesson, that might be nice. <laughs> Maybe that's a tough lesson to learn. You think so? Do you yeah. like writing obits? Because ML seems to you love. I mean, not love. I don't but. necessarily like writing obits. I don't know. If that's the phrase. Although I did write obits for the Free Press in the early 2000s on uh, on Sundays for a year or so. And I actually enjoyed what I liked was um, calling up the families and giving them a chance to talk about their, who, you know, the person that they loved. And it's because it surprised them, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they sent it in thinking they're going to get a paragraph and all of a sudden they get a reporter calling them saying, Hey, tell us about your father, or your grandmother, or your, your, your aunt, your mom. And they were probably just a, a regular Joe, a regular person. And, uh, and that I really liked. And then we'd write it. And back in those days when print was a little bit more, accessible it, they'd clip it out and send it around and and they'd laminate uh, it with three copies they would and, and that was actually from the managing editor yeah that was the piece that, that, that meant probably more than any other for an awful lot of people so yeah. i tried to take some pride in that huh. the only thing i would say about when you wrote obits because i wrote them too the only thing you did differently than i did was i would usually end the interview with you know anything else you'd like to say sean would usually end it with so you guys got a used car you know like go cheap <laughs> 
Yeah, that really sounds like me, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. y'all, y'all got any clothes you want to get rid of? Yeah, that- because I'm ever the entrepreneur. <laughs> but, you know. You know. But I, but I learned. There's no, there's no shame in frugality. The, I learned from the best, right? Yeah, there you go. But well, uh, well, if you are frugal and you need a car, is there any place you should go, ML? Oh my goodness! Speaking of speaking of I shameless, thought se- I shameless thought you were commerce. setting yourself up with a segue. No, 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 no. But you know, that's a, a lot of people will <laughs> troll the obits and they will contact those families and say, "Do you want to sell?" Seriously? Grandma, Absolutely, because people are always looking to unload those cars, and they are always, uh, you know. They're always just thinking about I need to move this. In fact, uh I guess I'm not surprised, but that's pretty shitty. <laughs> so so I love mid eighties Buick Rivieras and my mechanic Dave of course you do. had one that somebody brought in because it was their uncle or their grandpa's car it was in the garage. They sold it, it was it was it was cherry and they sold it for like thirty four hundred dollars. And I said, Dave. Now mechanically, one of the worst vehicles ever. Style wise, gorgeous. But I said, Dave, if you ever Get your hands another Cherry Buick Riviera at a good price. Just buy it, and I'll reimburse you. So, so no, it's, it does happen. It does happen. Why? Why that car for you? The, the lines on it are gorgeous. Okay. I mean, it's it's got that that beautiful prominent grill, a beautiful hood ornament. Uh, all the sheet metal just has this beautiful flow to it. I like the Landau top. A lot of people think it's cheesy, but I like it. It kind of gives it that old carriage look. It's got the opera lights inside. the The front <laughs> seats are like recliners. They have these 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 pillow backs, and they're they're fantastic bucket seats. And if you got one that actually was tuned a little bit, it had a V eight engine, or it could have a hopped up six if you got the sport model, and it could really go. But you'd get in that car. I, I had a, a beater version when I was in New Hampshire. Does that look like it on the screen right there? Is that the one you're thinking uh, of? I don't. see. I think I think I'm looking at okay. Yes, yes. That that doesn't have the Landau, but I had a ski rack I would throw on that, and I'd just go up in the mountains in New Hampshire on a Sunday with my skis up there on the Buick, and I just probably look like that guy in the picture, man. Uh, Let me see him again. Is he handsome, man? No. Okay, then I look like that guy. (laughs) Actually, I kind of look like that woman. White pants. I I ditched the bucket hat. Silk red shirt and a white bucket hat. I don't like that they're parked on the grass that close to the dock. That seemed dangerous in that picture there. Uh, you know they're a little bougie there, those Buick owners. Yeah. But, but if you're looking for a new ride, and I yeah. think this is this is what Mark wanted people to think about. Always. Or you need service, or you need repairs, like that that Buick always did, or just a top notch oil change. Roy O'Brien Ford is the place to go. You can go to the corner of Nine Mile and Mac, where people have been going for seventy five years. Take a look. Take a ride. Check it out. Beautiful sheet metal. Functional sheet metal, of course, the best-selling vehicle of all times, the F-150 is there. But if you don't quite feel like going down there, go to RoyO'Brien.com. That's R-O-Y-O-B-R-I-E-N.com. And check out Fast Track, which lets you choose your vehicle and options. But that's not all. You can pick your deal, lease, finance, or cash, get the value of your trade-in, apply for financing, and schedule delivery of your ride. If you go in person, Roy O'Brien has taken care of their employees and their customers by having PPE, social distancing. The waiting room is spaced out, but still very, very comfortable and luxurious. And, of course, you can still check out those rides, as I recently did when I did a show from the front seat of an F-150. I can tell you they're taking every measure to protect you and your health while you figure out what's the best deal for you. To learn more, visit RoyO'Brien.com or call 888-566-566. 5851 and be sure to tell them that ML Elric and his friends at the Soul of Detroit sent you their way. You have friends at the Soul of Detroit? Well, I'd like to think of maybe acquaintances. Okay, that's good. By the way, sh- I, I should. So I want to know about Joe Disselheim. Yeah, Let's yeah. not forget about Joe. Yeah, I was just going to say we at least need to say his name, right? Well, I did toss to you about 15 <laughs> minutes ago. I- yeah, right. And, I, and you asked me if I liked writing no bits, and we discussed it. And then you wanted to talk about some Cutlass. Was it a Cutlass? I don't know. Buick Riviera. Buick Riviera. I like the Cutlass. Was- Remember the Cutlass Supreme? It was uh, the same. It was the same uh, yeah. body style. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah, falling yeah. into the trap again. Are I you going to talk about? By, by the way, Sean, since you brought it up, I, I the first car I ever had What's that was in your a. Hand? It's a carrot. Uh, it's and I am glad to see you. Uh, the, the first car I ever bought that was a 1979 right. Cutlass Supreme. If, if nobody can see it, by the way, it's about three inches. It's a. It's very floppy. It's a half inch wide. It's a little flaccid, <laughs> and it's maybe four inches long. Last time Sean okay, something like, saw something like this, he was running water through it. <laughs> Used water. 
you'll figure that out on your own. But um, but the '79 Cutlass Supreme Brome, yeah. black rally wheels, red crushed velour interior. Oh my god! I did like the crushed velour. Also a dog, but a great car. Yeah, I had a Nova though. So what did uh? '78 Pontiac Grand Prix too. It had a bench seat. I much prefer the bucket seats, but depending on where you are and who you're with, the bench seat, very handy. Well, if I'm going to be with you, definitely a bench seat. A wonderful eulogy you'll be for, in the uh, trunk. for former Free Press yeah, Sports Joe? Joe? <laughs> you know you want the toss, and yeah. then you throw it away. <laughs> you just throw it away. Uh, throw it right back at Bounce it right back to ML. No, uh, Joe Distelheim was a... Was a um, and now it's time for our great debate. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Joe, I'm getting the mat treatment here. Joe, Joe, just real quickly, because uh, you know, I'm sure most people, uh, most of our listeners have no idea who Joe Dislaheim was. He was a. Uh, most of our listeners are listening to something else, not it. Yeah, that's probably true. He was a. Uh, What's that Leduff guy doing? Sports editor at the Detroit Free Press from 1980 to 1985, and he hired, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 people. That changed that department and uh, and and put that department on the map, including Mike Downey, John Ed Howard, That's huge Downey, Mark Downey Cram, was awesome. Mark Cram. He hired Gene Myers, who went on to be the editor, at the, at, and who recently re- when did Gene leave? Three four years ago. Uh, one of the best editors the papers ever had. Um, a lot of folks like that, and of course he hired Mitch Album. Um, he went off to Stanford to do one of the remember the fellowships. You would take a professional break. He he went and did a fellowship for a year. He came back and was the assistant to. Uh, the publisher, and then ended up running his own paper in Alabama, and that's where I met him. And Aniston Star, right? Aniston Star first, and then the Huntsville Times. And he turned just sort of randomly. I, I'll never forget because there was a recruiter at the Free Press at the time I'd been in contact with, and he wanted me to go out and work at a smaller paper. This is back in the days when you had to do that and kind of work your way up. And he called and he said, "Hey, there's an opening in an Al- in Alabama, in northern Alabama, with a really good editor." And I didn't know about Joe at all, and I called uh, I called my wife and said, "Hey, there's a possibility in Alabama. Can I can I curse on the air?" Yeah, of course. And she said this, and I hate to say this because our boys were bound there, down there, born down there. We ended up loving it. Um, she hadn't been out Ann Arbor much, and uh, so I said, "What do you think of Alabama?" And she said, "No fucking way." <laughs> And that was how that was how my it's relationship. A real lady. Yeah, that was how my <laughs> my relationship started. And I hate to say that because I have a lot of friends, and still to this day, and uh, we loved it. And you know, sometimes you just don't know any better, right? Especially if you're a northerner, you look down on the south, and she had a little bit of that in her, and uh, it quickly um, changed. In any case, Distelheim turned this little paper, and not little, but this sort of mid-sized paper in Alabama, into into kind of a a regional powerhouse and he sent us all over the country we had people that left the world we did huge investigative projects it was a group of fantastic writers he was just one of these editors he was talented enough to go run the post a place like that but he just kind of found his home there and um the the amount of journalists that he mentored and the, the careers he changed is sort of staggering and uh, in any case, that's what I wrote about was kind of his legacy, what he was like, what kind of stories mattered to him, what kind of journalism mattered to him. He was just sort of an old school guy that way. Didn't look like one, looked more like a professor, but uh, a grammarian, a stickler. He was tough. He was a former Marine. And uh, boy, when you got a manila envelope from him, he'd take <laughs> your clip and he'd, you know, you never knew if it was going to be written up and, and he was upset with you. But every once in a while, he'd, he'd say, you know, good job or whatever. And you, oh. you held on to those. In fact, when he died last week, there were former uh, folks who had worked for him posting some of those handwritten notes that they'd saved for the last 30 years. That's how much they met on, on cool. Facebook. And Yeah, it was, it was really That's something. Nice. In yeah. any case, kind of, a, kind of a part of a different era of, uh, of journalism. So I, I want to, because Sean doesn't want to blow his own horn, I want to read a little bit of his writing, mainly because he's polishing his own flute. But Joe, uh, uh, Sean wrote, a good editor is like a good therapist who is also like a good scout. And if Joe Distelheim had his druthers, he might have been unearthing baseball players for the Chicago Cubs instead of rooting them on while chasing stories about city councils and school boards. Not that Distelheim did anything other than love newspapers and journalism over the course of his 38-year career that included time as free press sports editor. It's just that he loved baseball a little more and his wife Dottie even more than that. In fact, he said as much, or more accurately, he was fastidious in his pursuit of accuracy, wrote as much in an obituary he recently penned. And now here's where Distelheim takes over. He loved his wife, the Chicago Cubs, in that order, honest, and life on Hilton Head Island. He hated bigotry. Misuse of the apostrophe, never to form plurals, people. And that stupid tree on number six at the country club of Hilton Head. 
All who knew them understood that his best quality was his wife of 40 years, Dottie, the finest wife in the history of wives. Pretty good stuff by Sean and Joe Distelheim. So thanks for saying that, Sean. Thanks for the mark that Joe made in this town that is still here. And if you want to see people talk about Joe and read the rest of this column, please check out Freep.com because uh, this is a life worth remembering. And, uh, and the best part about writing obituaries is you usually bring in either some glory to someone who didn't get enough or you're sharing an amazing life one more time. Let me, let me just ask you guys real quickly because and Joe. That was the natural out. No, okay, no, 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 but seriously, <laughs> no, I know. You know this, this is a podcast. Come on. And it's, uh, in any case, anarchy. do y'all have anybody in your life that uh, you can look back and say that person kind of opened the door, got me in, gave me a break, mentored me? I mean, because yeah, I still that's what he them. was. He's upstairs. Okay, okay, yeah, of okay. Course. that's good. What about you? You who know, I, uh, Hugh McDermott Sr. was somebody who I always admired. Not the smart-ass kid, Junior. That kid's pain on balls. But uh, I always thought that... Um, that Joe, that Hugh was someone who I would someday like to emulate. And, um, and I never became a political columnist. And at the point in my career where somebody offered me a column, I said, I, I don't want to tell people what to think anymore. I just want to show them what's happening and let them make up their own minds. But the thing about Hugh that I'll, I'll never forget and that I, I, uh, treasure and do use to this day is whenever something big was going on, Hugh was there. It seemed like if there was something happening that was important, he was there. And whether he wrote about it or not, he was there. And people who knew what was going on knew that. And it gave him a credibility and it gave him a insight that you don't see so much these days. And I think one of the really important things when I think about Hugh Sr. that really breaks my heart is that Republicans or Democrats trusted him confided in him, respected him, and knew that what he printed was the truth or what he believed to be the truth or what he thought was important. And I think we've lost people that uh, we can turn to like that in journalism and in society because now if you write one good thing about the other side, you're immediately on that other side. And there's no one who's considered to be a fair broker or just just – sort of a guy who's who's kind of keeping track and uh and so i would say uh i would say hugh was like that for me and he was funny and he was he was um raw and he um he wrote a uh, a reference letter for me that when i when i shared it with potential employees i was like is this supposed to help me because it, it said good things but it also said some stuff like despite his perhaps too casual mane and a bunch of other stuff like <laughs> yeah. this i'm like you know can we just leave out the things about but what an it, asshole but did it i help am you? did it help <laughs> yeah the first job i got one of the guys who uh who had spent some time in michigan brought the letter uh to the interview and said to the guy who was doing the hiring um if Hugh McDermott says this guy's okay. Well, there you go. By the way, I used to like to run my fingers through that mane. But um, what about you, Mark? <laughs> meant more casual. How, how did Drew mean. help you? I'm curious. Oh, well, I think a lot of what I've learned and what I do is because of watching him and learning from him. I mean, I think it, isn't that obvious and clear? Maybe no, I just, no, maybe no, it's just, no, so I just mean to early me. on. Did he? How did, oh, how did well, you I, got, I started as you? an intern. Okay. So, okay. you know, busted my ass, I like to think, and learn from him. Mainly about busting your ass and doing a lot of work and. I don't know. I guess I just. I guess it worked too well. Uh, turned out. It turned out all right, didn't it? I, I think so. Would uh, Would Joe Disselheim feel that maybe we buried a lead today in the show? Oh, he absolutely would. And by and by the way, real quickly, he he took a chance on me. I was a short order cook with a couple of freelance clips. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's and, cool. And he told me, and I wrote about this. He told me the reason he took a chance. He figured if I could handle a breakfast rush, I could probably handle a deadline. Turned out not to be true. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, why don't you bring some some eats next time? And, you know, and I don't even know if I can flip eggs anymore. But in any case, uh, yeah, buried the lead. We've done that for way too long. You and I've been sitting on this for. I know. Way too long. Well, before we do that, <laughs> before yes. we do that, oh. I, I want to raise a glass to Benny Napoleon, sure. to Alto Reed, and to Joe Gistelheim. And you know, when I raise a glass, it's full of Altus beer. It's the original Detroit lager that's making a comeback here in the greatest city in the world. 
which also contains the greatest city council district, which would be oh, district huh. number four. Altus is the do anything, anytime with anyone beer. Seriously, I love taking it to hockey, not just because it means I'm actually able to go play hockey, but because it's the kind of beer that everybody says, yes, sir. Give me another one. I'm cold. Altus is. I even try to make sure to keep it stocked at home right now. I keep it in the garage where it's the perfect temperature and it's, it's, it's a good, good yard beer, but it's also one that you want to bring out for your special guest. What is the perfect temperature? Um, not quite freezing, okay. but not, not boiling. So you so, want a tiny so. bit of slush in there or no? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I, like I don't. I don't think Carl would want any ice in his Altus, but uh, but I like. You like a little slush. Like a little, little frosty. Like little putting frosty. your Chablis over. Oh, Chablis, uh, too dated. Putting your Chardonnay over ice. I thought it was Shabless. Okay. He played first base <laughs> or you for more the of Yankees. A Sauvignon uh, woman. It's not a podcast. Not a Sauvignon podcast. Blanc. Sorry. Anyways, a fun fact about Sean. Yeah. About uh, about Altus. <laughs> it can make Sean a ten. It only takes six to make Sean a ten. That's right. So a lot of great things started here in Detroit that went away. Altus is back. If you want to find out where to buy it, go to altus.beer. It's on the shelf at your store. And if it's not, let them know and they will get it there. And once the bars reopen, uh, you can get some. In fact, it's on tap at the Cadu Cafe. So I look forward to pulling a pint with Mr. John Rutherford. And of course, when we raise those glasses, it will be full of Altus. Beer. So here's a here's a beer to those we missed and who we remember and we'll talk in about uh, forevermore. So so thank you. Okay, so I am running for Detroit City Council. Now it's time for your great debate. <laughs> that's all. That's all you want to say about. Well, it? I don't know. You guys are in such a rush. Well, uh, such a rush. I, I mean, that's pretty big news. It is big news. You know, the last show you mentioned how you were leaving the free press. Yesterday was your last day, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, yesterday was my last day. And did we have a going away party for you? Or did well, was, I mean, just pull footage from had, the archives of all the there, other going away parties? There have been four going away parties for me at the Free Press. Which one are you referring to? And I'll tell you, the last one sucked because it turned out I was the last guy at the anchor. I was totally blown out, and there was nobody to drive me home, and I had to drive there myself. So the bar closed. The Dedarians would let you stay for a while, but at some point you got to go home. I was not in any shape to drive, so I just went to sleep in my car Um on, uh, I think it was second maybe. And just off of uh fort street and, uh, woke up at like, I don't know, three thirty or four in the morning when somebody was tapping on my window to see if they could steal my car. I was like, it's time for me to go. So, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully no more going away parties, but, um, Oh, it's nice that you had so many people you could call to give you a ride. <laughs> <laughs> You've made a lot of nice relationships over the years and it really helped out on a night like that. I was thinking it was nice that somebody picked me up for the damn party. I hate going away party. I didn't even want to have the damn party. I just wanted, I like to just, by the way, how I long is like the city face? council term? Four years. Okay. So we'll see you back in four years. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, you, you may, you may see me back in 10 months. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got to win. They're going, but, uh, but yes. Yeah, so, um, before we went on break, we kind of teased that I was leaving the free press. Um, in fact, uh, my last story, while we should have been recording last week's episode, I was driving to Western Michigan trying to convince the, uh, purported leader, ringleader of the alleged plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer. I was trying to convince his uncle to speak to me because none of the family members would talk to me. And I'm pleased to say that that gentleman did agree to, uh, to share some insights with me. I appreciate his confidence. And that story will be showing up pretty soon at Freep.com. So please check that out. I'm, uh, I'm a reporter till the end. And as I've been telling people, I'm a reporter until I'm not a reporter. And as of midnight last night, even though I kind of work till two in the morning, just to tie up some loose ends <laughs> and I still have to put in some expenses. Damn it. Uh, uh, I'm no longer a reporter at the Detroit Free Press. I have filed paperwork to run for Detroit City Council in District 4. And this is not how you wanted the announcement to go, right? So it sounds like uh, the media yeah, the, ruined your launch. Dreaded, well, dreaded. First of all, Alto Reed was supposed news, to play the, uh, the national anthem, so that's out. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to go to Clarence Clemens. You got scooped on your own story. Welcome to the other side. Yeah, well, here's the problem. I got scooped on my own story by the other paper because they have a pretty good city hall reporter over there who was checking the filings. Is that really how, how she found out? Either that or somebody called her and said, check this out, but just tell people you checked the files. Or, or maybe the other paper that you used to work at knew and was being cordial. Uh, oh, well, of course they had to have known, right? right. I'll, I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves. But no, you, don't so, you don't work there anymore. What's that? There were people there that knew. 
They were just trying to treat what, you with some... Uh... No, they knew because I told them. But I mean, I, listen, hey, I, I'm not... This is not meant in any way to disrespect the free press. The free press that is, didn't take long, is it, tremendous. Well, it didn't take long for you to flip it with your fake news journalism bullshit. I'm sick of you guys. <laughs> I've been a politician for 10 hours. I'm already taking the ass from a bunch of busters. You can't speak like that. Who man. couldn't we're shine my right shoes. Now. But, um, but uh, no... It, no disrespect to the free press. I love the free press. I, I never wanted to go anywhere but the free press. Just fate Four has, times. Has, has, well, you know what? Let's just <sighs> put it this way. Sometimes uh, sometimes uh, you're working for the wrong people. Sometimes you're working for the right people. There's a better opportunity. I'm just trying to give credit to Christine Ferretti of the Detroit News, who who did some of the the kind of shoe leather reporting that good reporters do. She found this. We didn't want this to become public. Until later this month, we Ooh. thought we would tell everybody at the same time about it. But uh, but when you create a public record, good reporters check public records and they come up with scoops. And so, yeah, I got scooped on my own story. It kind of sucks. But, uh, but that really is what politics is like. You have things you want to do. You have an agenda. You have a plan. And then something happens. I mean, I, I don't know that George W. Bush had a great plan. But less than a year after he was president, 9-11 happened. And all of a sudden, whatever the hell he thought he was going to be doing for the next three or four or eight years was all turned upside down. And I've seen it from the journalism side when the story or the, the agenda gets overtaken by events. And now I've experienced it even before I really was officially a candidate. I guess I'm officially a candidate because we filled out candidate paperwork. But I had people calling me for months. I had people call me since I left Fox 2 asking me, are you running for something? The mayor asked me one time over the summer if I was running for city council. And I said, well, Mr. Mayor, I was thinking I might run for your job. And he just <laughs> kind of laughed. I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe they can't tell the two white mics apart. We'll have to see. But uh, You're very important. Do you want to hear some uh, comments on the Detroit News article? Please. I'm fairly certain I do not. What? But I Everyone loves I comments respect, on a newspaper. I respect, you know what? I, as someone who's worked at a newspaper and on TV, the last thing that I ever <laughs> want to hear is what people have to say about me because it usually involves what I look like, what I sound like. Uh, the first one's very nice. It says, if it wasn't for Elric and Jim Schaefer, Kwame would still be pillaging the city of Detroit. Who's um, Schaefer? Yeah. Left him behind. I'm more, more of an Altus guy. <laughs> is he? The next one uh, is, isn't he white? Uh, I, I think that recipes are locator. Uh, what? There's another carrot. Uh, next one. Love it. Wish he was running in my district. Number five. And then this guy says, Mr. East English Village and man of the people sends his kids to University Liggett School in Gross Point. Tough to do on a free press salary. Yeah, in fact, it's impossible to do on a free press salary. And at the time my kids were going to high school, I was at Fox 2. University of Liggett, fine private school on the east side. Uh, my children did not go there. So, uh, so I will just tell you what I often say to people on social media. Uh, do what I do. Do your research. Make sure you know what you're talking about before you say something. And if you can't do that, there's a part of my body you can kiss. But uh, I can't let you do that right now because I'm using it to sit in this chair. And mo most of them are very positive. People um, oh, okay. really support the decision. And then there's uh, Elric's no better than Pew. <laughs> I would so say, I will tell I, you this. I would say you're a lot better than him considering where he is right now. I, I'm not ready to unveil my agenda, but I will promise everybody. And it's a very, very light promise because it's 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 not offering very much but i will be better if elected than the last guy from fox 2 and then the last white guy i promise you that the last white guy gabe leland oh yeah yeah yeah. okay dirtbag councilman for three years we've known he's a crook he's still there what the hell's going on and then uh john uh the last comment is good luck ml you were the last real investigative reporter in town to which someone <laughs> replied just another button paid for a rodent Wow. So there's the uh, lovely comment. It actually wasn't comments. bad. I thought it was a lot better than I expected. Well, I mean, it's, the story's fairly new. I'm sure other people will pile in there. Uh, I'll just you're, tell you really one thing. you're looking for more negative. Haters are not waiters. If you've got some bile, you spew it as soon as you can. The thoughtful comment is often the one that takes the longest to offer. So so that's that's pretty good. If that's as bad as it gets, this will be, uh, be a lot better than I think I, it's going to be. But I, I, just, I think it's. I just have so many questions. Yeah, go. Uh, oh. Sure. Well, should they be answered in the great debate? <laughs> yeah, let's. let's sure. right. I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. Very nerd, very so, very nerd, very so, very nerd infinity, very so infinity plus one. No. 
I thought you were taking over, Mark. I'm, I, I was about yeah, to. I'm out of journalism for like kind of 12 nice. hours, and all of a sudden, Mark's usurping, you know. Kind of nice, actually. My first question is, and I guess the overall debate actually, is. Actually, can I ask a question first? Sure. What, what's the greatest place in the world to get get fine meats <laughs> and, and treats? And that, uh, That's and, why I didn't leap into my question, because oh. I didn't know <laughs> we were going to do a read here. But there's no doubt when it comes to fine meats and eats, it's the butchery on Orchard Lake Road, just west of Middle Belt. Um, go in there, see Chef Dave, buy all the meat he has. You can get Elta's there, too. I was there over the break. But not um, with slush in it. No, definitely. No, he keeps it at a proper temperature. Uh, exactly. Uh, they make the homemade sausage. They're just the best cuts Marbling. of meat. I got, to, well, speaking of marbling, man, I got a prime rib. I never cooked one before. And how did that turn out? Perfect. You roasted it. I roasted it for what felt like Did you make forever. a little jus? No. No, that sounds like too much work. Okay. But if, you, uh, if you're up for making uh, whatever Sean just said, go to thebutchery.com. That's what you dip your prime rib in. Now who's speaking French? Come on. I'm sorry, thebutcherysl.com. Uh, see all their amazing selections. I like to call it meat porn because all the pictures on there just look so great. Um, don't Google meat porn, by the way. Um, see all their amazing selections. You can follow them on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook to see what Chef Dave is carving up. He's <laughs> There's more meat porn for you. 248-682-COWS. That's their number. Even if uh, they even will have small private cooking classes when this COVID thing is done. So Chef Dave and, and his wife is a chef, too. I, I don't want to cut her. Short, it's Chef Julie Hubbard. Uh, she makes a lot of good baked goods, too. But check them out. It's really it's worth the drive. TheButcherySL.com. Um, check it out. And order online. You can order online. They'll deliver anywhere. So Yeah, it's a it's a family-run business, and they, they treat you like family. And I will tell you, unlike uh, my colleagues here, I am completely and utterly ignorant of what the best of anything is. And whenever I go in there, I always bring something back that makes people think, boy, that Elric really knows his stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> yes. I don't know nothing, but I know some people who know something. And so the butchery is, uh, they will make you seem like a genius when you're really just some An unemployed idiot. podcaster. Like me. Running for has decided public to office. Go for Which, an entire year without a salary uh, and possibly um, the rest of his life without a salary by thinking that maybe he can okay, well that, that leads make it, things a little better. That leads into the debate question. I don't know. Why? Why would anybody run for public office? You know, it just hit me. I can't think of it. I, <laughs> I probably should have. I probably should have. Reflected on this a little more before I mean, throwing everything away. Wait, this is our it's, debate topic? What a horrible decision I've made. This is our debate topic? Are we going to debate about the debate topic again? Like I thought we were show? talking about Marianne and Ginger and we were going to do some sexist thing. There's no debate. It's Ginger. Um, so uh, <laughs> We were going to objectify women for 15 minutes. I thought, that's what I thought Maybe we were going to Maybe you were going to. Going to. Well, I was going to pay tribute to Don Wells, the late, great Marianne, and, of course, express my unending admiration for, uh, for Tina Marie. Otherwise known as Ginger, but uh, okay, Mark. What were you saying? Why? Oh, so quite simply, for 28 years now, I've been a reporter trying to hold public officials accountable. Yes, and uh, and I've been kind of a lone gunman. That there was the only one who's ever done it in the history of the world. (laughs) That's true. Certainly, uh, certainly, I I won't be the first politician to say would somebody shut that reporter up. (laughs) But um, um, you know. I moved back to Detroit over 20 years ago because I wanted to be a part of Detroit's comeback. It was important to me to be here for family and to help the city that I've always loved to now be actually a part of it, to be someone who doesn't just work here and travel through here, but to live here. And so for the last 20 years, I've been cutting lawns at the median, cutting lawns on houses that were empty. I've been a part of the neighborhood association. I've been a coach. I've been a school board member. I've been a volunteer. I've done cleanups. Uh, I've done charity events. But nobody likes politicians. Well, you know what? I, I think that's well, not true. People like their politician. We hear everybody hates Congress, but they still vote for their congressperson. And and I think that's because when you have somebody that you feel is making a difference, when you have someone you feel you can reach out to, when you have someone you feel you can call upon, when you have a problem. Or even when you have something you want to celebrate, that builds a bond. And as a reporter, I've I've done so many stories about city government, uh, exposed what's wrong, talked about what could be better. And at some point, you you say, I've done as much in this role as I can to make things better. 
And, you know, I, for the last couple of years, I've been a board member for the East English Village Neighborhood Association. For the last five years, I put on a charity hockey game in Southwest Detroit at Clark Park. Um, you know, I'm always involved in, in cleaning up in the neighborhood, coaching at the uh, ballpark in my district. And it's sort of like why when I came back to Detroit and wanted to go to Tiger games, I became a vendor because I wanted to have a more intimate relationship with Tiger Stadium. I wanted to get behind the scenes. I wanted to enjoy the ballpark before it was gone and get to know it in a way that you don't get to know it just by being a fan. And so in the same way that as a reporter, you know a lot and you see a lot, it's not quite the same thing as having a seat at the table. It's definitely not the same thing as having a vote. But in terms of having the ability to expose wrongdoing and to call for reform and to make things better, not only can I continue to do that, but if I get elected, I'll have a vote. And that's a pretty powerful thing, as, uh, as we know. In fact, if, if, if some dude had another 11,800 votes, I guess he would have won Georgia. But, uh, but that also involves uh, some chicanery, which I will never be involved in. But, but yeah, I mean, so I'm giving up a great job, one of the greatest jobs in all of journalism. I'm, I, yeah, can't, I, I can't be a paid reporter, so I'm giving up a year's income, which is never a good idea. But if you want to do something big, if you want to do something bigger than yourself, if you want to do something that you think is really challenging and important, you have to be willing to make a sacrifice and you have to take a risk. And if you are electing public officials who won't sacrifice, you are making a mistake. So I am making a sacrifice because I believe that the job is worth it. I believe the work is that important. And I believe that the people of Detroit, my neighbors and people throughout the city deserve no less than someone who's willing to put it all on the line for them. Well, better you. I mean, I, I would never be able to do it. But then again, you, you come from one very hated profession as a journalist and I guess podcasting? into another one. Oh, yeah. Well, podcasting, Sons too. Of bitches. Uh, do a couple of quick things. Mark, thanks for leaving me a pillow. Um, two. <laughs> <laughs> he's a politician now. So I know, gonna, I know. You know. Two, uh, I thought the campaign uh, sort of big speech was going to be next week. Well, the, uh, the, the, in, news, the pre, the in the pre-show, I didn't realize he was going to go on a 10-minute monologue. So is, is the is here's my question. Time's up. Here's my question. Is the uh, we getting to that question? Is the podcast going <laughs> to... Oh, yeah, of all people. Yeah, yeah. is the podcast going to change now? Because you were a little snippy before the show. I mean, our listeners couldn't hear because before the show started, but your tone was a little more... Oh, like, well, we were late. Uh, I'm looking down on you. Well, he was late. I'm looking down on you. I, I felt that. You're looking down on me? No, no. You, you, you were. But you get it. You, you get look a, like you get Mark an extension and I, ladder. Mark and I were the minions. Is somebody? I, I, I sensed that when you came in today. <laughs> so is that temporary? Are you going to re? Are you going to you know recalibrate your your equilibrium here? What's going to happen? I I will just tell you, when there's business to be done, and people are all about foolishness, the tone will be the same. I'm about getting shit done. Oh, okay. And I got questions, and if I don't get answers, okay, people may get a little venom. Okay, that's how it works. This is this is called uh, this is called this is called the carrot, <laughs> and you got a little bit of the stick. So, so, <laughs> so, so after years of that, which one you like there? Bullshit of hiding behind the uh, the fourth wall, the fourth state, and I'm not going to give my opinion. We're finally going to get your opinion. That's to me what's what this is really all about. We're finally going to get to know what you actually think. Uh, I mean, other than about new wave music. Um, I will be more opinionated because Good. because I don't have to be objective anymore. Good. But I will always be objective because I'm going to measure things based on the evidence. I'm going to believe the science. And if something is doesn't measure up, I'm going to tell you the truth. I mean, I kind of think I've been doing that anyways. I just let the facts speak for themselves and the facts will dictate things. The difference is... If this happens, again, I haven't been elected to anything. Um, if if this happens, then uh, when the facts speak, then I'll add my I'll add my voice to them. Um, so, so that'll be – actually, that'll be a little uncomfortable for me because really I think when people know the facts, they can make up their own minds. I, I, I don't, you know, people think of politicians as leaders, and I really think that's silly in a way because what they should be doing is following the wishes of the people. But there are moments when things happen where you don't have time to ask people what they think. That's when leadership comes through. That's that's the missiles of October. You know, that's 
That's John F. Kennedy deciding, are we going to go into a nuclear war? I don't think we're going to have issues like that in the city of Detroit. No, but we, we need leadership. I mean, people do. There's nothing wrong with expecting politics, politicians to show some traits of leadership. I agree, but, but that means people have to pick folks who have that character. And, you know, we've seen in the past people picking folks whose names they recognize, who seem real nice, whose dad they voted for, or whose mom they voted for. You know, it's time for us to have some elections where we say, uh, where we say, you know, we, we want you to tell us what you can do. Well, I think people know what I can do. They've seen me for the last 20 years trying to get to the bottom of things, trying to make sure that government works, calling out people who are, are cheating us, people who are stealing, who put self-service before public service. That's not going to change. Are you that's get, a, that's are you a good get line, some by sweet, the way. Uh, city council protection, like the kind that uh, had that incident with you. Well, in the uh, can you have Cushenberry's? Uh, are, are we going to have? Are we going to have agents stationed outside the studio here? It, right. I mean, you already seem intimidated. I don't want you to go into the fetal position. Well, I mean, I don't know. It's sound quality. You've already got initials in your name. Yeah, the job can corrupt a lot of people, but this guy is sitting across. Well, I, I think I, I said. Told, well, Perry, he's, he's, he's too ethical. I've told him that before. I said, well, you're too he, ethical. Yeah, he goes by ML. What too moralistic. How else can he be corrupted. <laughs> so, uh, t- to answer your question, you Mark, can. I'm going to yeah. qu- I'm going to quote uh, former state senator, former congressman, former mayoral candidate Hanson Clark, and just say, "I'm from the east side. I can take care of myself. I don't need any security." I mean, I I think that I think that having police protection for anybody but the citizens of Detroit is a misuse of resources. Um, I, th- I think we definitely want City Hall to be secure, but if a cop comes to me faster than he comes to your house, something's wrong. Well, the good thing is, too, you'll know that you can't dodge those reporters that are staking you out in the parking lot. Okay, You know, they put a fence around that parking lot. Oh, really? In the past year or so, and I was like, is, Who that, did? is that because of me? Uh, but the, of course it was. The, the it's building all authority because did. of you. Well, I was told that the reason the fence went up is because people were concerned about folks rolling up on council members. Now, I'm not aware of that ever happening before, but certainly uh, a certain reporter rolled up on him plenty of times. But um, That's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, these are crazy times. But, uh, but to me, <laughs> if you don't put the people you serve ahead of yourself, there was – so I, I, I was the uh, a chaperone a couple years in a row – at the sleepaway camp for uh, St. Clair Monte Falco uh, sixth grade trip, and um, and we stay at this uh, this the scout camp near Jackson, and in the cafeteria, it's chiseled in the wall above the fireplace. I'm third, and what it means because it's a scout camp and it's a YMCA and it's a Christian based thing that 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 if you're third, God is first, everybody else is second. And you're third. And I think any politician who doesn't adopt that position, and if you're an atheist, then you're second, okay? But but if you're putting yourself first, it's it's all wrong. Oh man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Did I do that? What a dork. Does him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek? Or we're turning into cool guys? So I'm not the only person who believes in putting others ahead of themselves. I think there's a fellow named Luke Nowacki who puts other people's interests first. <laughs> what a smooth segue. And, and maybe thinks he's God. I don't know about that. He, he's pretty good looking. Uh, he's a handsome man. The market's been a... A noble bearing. <laughs> a what? A noble bearing. He's got dimples in his cheeks and his chin. He looks like Kirk Douglas with a buzz cut. Bearing, he's Spartacus. Well, if you uh, if you watch the market, you've seen it's been. A, I don't know what it's done today. Yesterday was a total disastrous day. So you got to have a plan, and nobody knows what to do. So just call our buddy Luke Nowacki at Pinnacle Wealth Strategies if you want to run for public office, like uh, some other people do. He can get your finances straight before you do that. He can help you find a way to protect for your retirement future. That uh, you know anything you want. Oh, it's a, oh, it's up big today. Thank you, Sean. Sean coming in with the finance report. Uh, you know that's so why. Big. But still, you got to have a plan. So call Luke, 248-663-4748. Um, email him, too. It's on his website. Can't say enough good things about the guy. Just let him do all the money work for you. But the one thing Luke will tell you is market goes up and down. Don't get fooled by the day-to-day stuff. He's a man with a plan. Yeah, and he'll make it. All about you, sweetheart. 
Securities and investment advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associates, Inc. Member FINRA SIPC. Royal Alliance Associates, Inc. is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names, products, or services referenced here are independent of Royal Alliance Associates, Inc. Do you want me to start? Somebody said for independence. Um, yes, so it's time for our Geek of the Week, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to start or, uh, or go last, but since everybody else is, is, is pushing me around this week, I should probably oh, just let you guys Wow, you're playing the victim? You're having a tough week? Wow, that didn't take long. That I, I feel bad that I hurt Sean's that feelings. That didn't take Hardly. How did you hurt my feelings? That's what you said earlier. Do you want to go first, Sean? I did. Well, you suggested it. I did. Sean doesn't like to hurt anyone's feelings. What Don't say that. About? That's the meanest trick you can do to Sean. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll go first. All right. Who do you got? All right. Well, just see if you can guess this is. Four years ago, 2016, this man lost the primary caucus, the Iowa caucus, to Donald. Uh, no, excuse me. He beat Donald Trump in the primary. Okay. In Iowa. And Trump suggested that he... Um, you know, that there was fraud, right? That it was not a legitimate outcome. Do you guys remember this? I, you know, it's funny. Wait, I, which election was fraudulent? I'm losing track no, now. I know, I know. But no, would Trump lost Iowa in 2016 in the primary and suggested that there was fraud involved. Sure. The man who won that happened to be Ted Cruz. Oh. Who yeah. said at the time, when Donald loses yeah. what he loses, he blames everybody else. It's never Donald's fault, right? Yeah, that's right. So Trump goes on to win. He blames. He asked for to today. Exactly. He trashes Ted Cruz's wife. Ted Cruz says he's the biggest history, uh, the biggest liar in the history of mankind, a narcissist uh, to the degree of which you've never seen. Blah, 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 blah. All this. And then all of a sudden, now where we're at, yeah. he's licking his boots and trying to justify this. Uh, I, I'm going to call it a coup. Right, trying by yeah. trying to say that it's going to suppress, not suppress, but um, just object. try to get this yeah. object and try to get the Senate and the, and the House. It's not going to happen in the House, but try to get the Senate to change their mind and not accept the electors. So for the hypocrisy, and he's just doing this right because he wants Donald Trump's wants voters. Of course, he's also a strict constructionist of the Constitution, but now he's stretching the Constitution exactly as much as. Well, I don't because politics comes first. Exactly. But it's just, really why. Of, it's just staggering. Ted Cruz is way too sm- I mean, maybe that's why he's doing it. He's, re- he's a smart, smart guy. guy. Absolutely. He should be above this, right? Be, it's He'll just, tell you he's a smart guy. I mean, why not just try to go get the voters with what you believe in and all of that? Why do you have to do it this way? Anyway, yeah, for that. Game. What's that? Because it's a game. Yeah, but this is a I, game I with some consequences that might get kind of scary at some point. Where we're never going to believe in election anymore, right? Uh, he was talking the other day about the, we, the, all the widespread voter fraud. That's just not true, and people believe that. I, I understand. Millions of people are believe that. I, right I think. Now. I think the overwhelming majority of people, even people that voted for him, understand that. Though I really do. So and I think the cruiser. People, What's Even that? if you say majority, we're still talking about forty million people. What's oh, that? I think it's, you, you picked a cruiser. Yeah, so cruise. And I, yeah, I'd hate to pick so, somebody so out there, but. That's fine. The heck with it. No, did my. You, did you see what uh, Al Franken wrote about Ted Cruz? It was actually the funniest line in his book that, in the end, wasn't very funny, which was kind of disappointing. But he said, uh, "He said I like Ted Cruz more than almost all of my colleagues, and I hate Ted Cruz." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. That's a strong line. No, uh, my my nominee is, and I, I try to unplug on vacation away from the job. I try not to follow so much news. But boy, I really dove into what I, I, to me, is the best story of 2020, and it's the hilarious Baldwin story. Hilaria Baldwin, Alex's wife. Do you guys know about this story? I, I try and avoid the Baldwins, except for except for uh, Stephen, who makes some of the finest direct to video movies you'll ever find. She, do you know the story, Sean? Not really. So she uh, has said all along that she's from Spain. Her home is in Spain, and there's so many. Um, examples and video examples of her talking about being from Spain. The problem is, is that she was born Hillary uh, Thomas, uh, another hyphenated name, from a very uh, privileged family. I believe her dad was a Harvard doctor, something like that, from Boston, not from Spain. And so she's perpetrated this thing that she is Spanish because, oh, well, she grew up there, and it's just become this hilarious firestorm. She was born Hillary, not Hilaria. And I, I don't know, I just... To, to, I, I'm assuming she did this because she thought it made her more interesting than just, quote, another boring, uh, privileged white woman from Boston. You know, instead right. she's Hispanic because she's from Spain. And I got to tell you, I think it is the most interesting thing about her now, this lie. So she's my nominee. So cultural appropriation by Mrs. Baldwin. 
Yeah. Yeah. Damn. And did she ever live in Spain? Uh, I guess she spent some time there, but she's not she's not from Spain. Damn. Okay. Well, uh, more more good choices by by Alec. She also slips in and out of an accent on multiple interviews. Oh man. No. To which she blames on being bilingual, which I don't hear other bilingual people do, but what do we know? She's she, a Baldwin. I'm bilingual, huh? Okay. Um well my my choice is Louis Gohmert. Uh you may remember uh the former judge who no, now I don't. Co- now congressman from <laughs> Texas. He was the one who was against masks but then wore a mask and got oh, COVID-19 and said I must have got it from the mask. Yeah. So uh, old Lou is back. He is urging the vice president to reject electors from certain states on January 6th when Mike Pence is supposed to log the electors and declare the winner of the presidential race. And that's all well and good, whatever. I, I don't want to get in. I think Sean's very well covered uh, the, the fact that this election was legal and all that other stuff. But here's my reason for picking Louis Gohmert, because it turns out that Louis Gohmert, one of the people who believes there is a deep state, turns out to be a <laughs> member of the deep state. <laughs> so it turns out that these wackos are right, but only because they are the thing that they profess to hate. Just like the people who bitch about fake news turn out to be the people who generate all the BS that truly is fake news. So the right honorable Louis Gohmert from the great state of Texas, sir, y'all are my geek of the week. The kids are soft. I don't care for that guy. Me neither. Too soft. I'm going to pretend like you need this to make my dick go soft. Soft things are nice, but not as nice as saving money. And thanks to our sponsor, Hall Financial, who's been a great supporter of all the shows on the Red Shovel Network. We have a message to bring to you. What's Rates are currently in the twos. Wow. It doesn't get much lower than I guess it gets to the ones. And I guess it gets the sub uh, ones. You should take advantage of it now. But yeah, if you're waiting for that, you're a fool. Rates are currently in two, so call today and find out how much of a refi could save you every month. A refi can save you money. First of all, you're going to save money because you're spending less on what you owe because you have a lower interest rate. You're also going to save money because when you do a refi, you usually get to skip one or two months of payment while the paperwork goes through and everything like that. So that's immediate savings as well as long-term savings so just click on the link on our website to get started or give give a little jingle to 248-308-5000 that's 248-308-5000 ask for my man dan morris and i'm sure he's rested up from the holiday so he can start making some great deals for you and when you call dan or whoever answers the phone make sure you tell him that ml sent you hi matt hi jingle jangle so matt i understand your resolution is to be funny. Oh, that was ouch. your New Year's resolution? Ouch! It's true. And, you know this, is, and you know any new people here. Um, I am Doctor Kiddo Jennings, and this is a part of the show when you realize the comedy classes I bought I have not started yet. <laughs> so that that's that, that that's my uh, intro or my disclaimer for the show from now on. Okay, well, resolutions are made to be broken. <laughs> oh um, man! I thought ow. you might wait until the second week of January. <laughs> Before you backslide. Yeah, why not? You know, start start off fresh. Matt, 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 course, Matt. F- I have a what? question for you, Matt. Do you mind if I use the restroom? Oh, Go no. ahead. There we go. I'm kidding, man. There's an empty Happy New Year. Can Happy New Year, Matt. Oh, Happy, follow that with Happy New Year. Don't don't pretend to be nice to Happy him. Happy New Year. No, no, no. Happy New Year. Yeah. No, I'm it sorry. He's been, been filling my 20- Facebook timeline with, uh, you know, Schlong jokes for three weeks. So. Oh, speaking of Facebook, <laughs> do we have any face Facebook live comments? Yeah, I'll on, look. I'll look on all up. this. I'll I mean, yeah, and comments about you and your yeah. decision. No, I just. I mean, your, let's get yeah, some more. Let's, let's be honest. What it's really about. Let's get some more. Let's get some more mean tweets out there. Well. He doesn't hide that well, does he? Oh, okay. Know, okay sorry, somebody, man. This is the only polling did. I can afford. <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can't even afford a somebody, Twitter poll. We'll do it under the guise of polling. Yes, Matt. <laughs> Hey, somebody did ask uh, if ML was going to run as ML or and hide behind oh. his periods. 
That's a that's a good question. Will you? What, how will you appear on the ballot? Because you had to file the paperwork. Will it be? You ML just skipped or? over the joke, though. Yeah, so, I knew that. I just wanted to move on. I, it was gross. So the uh, <laughs> so that, is, that is gross. <laughs> so on the ballot, I'm I'm sure I'll appear as as M L Elric, but um, but the uh, statement of organization uh, lists the campaign as Michael Lewis Elric for Detroit. Yeah, I was going to say I didn't even know you were allowed to use initials. Uh, you can use what you're known as, but your full name has to appear on the ballot. Was that a, bi- a, a ring, a bell? Did I hear that in the background? I think yeah, it's, anytime it's ML related, there's a bell. I, think I thought it was, it was a, Kilpatrick. Uh, I think it was a phone. Who, someone's phone so it wasn't phone. actually the Kilpatrick bell in anticipation of <laughs> no. something. Okay. But right. Kilpatrick has to do with ML. So, you know, ipso facto, ML. Related. Oh, a lot of land you, flying man. around today. I know. That was the second time. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you what do you Matt, have for us today, Maddie? Come on, Matt. Okay. Well, you know, this is all um it's all happened on New Year's Day, and I thought that was important to clarify. And uh, since two thousand, Hershey, Pennsylvania used a giant kiss to ring in the new year. Other cities in Pennsylvania, like Mechanicsburg, drops a wrench. In Dillsburg, they drop a pickle. And in intercourse, they dropped a small talk. Yeah, that was cute. Ooh, you get, you get right to daddy. it, Daddy. Daddy likes a little small talk no, in intercourse. Don't call yourself Daddy and don't start doing it. That's great. You ruined a pretty <laughs> cute joke. Uh, hey, what do you want more? I want you to, uh, to stop do another improving is what he's saying. Yeah, and stop uh, trying to sound sexy. <laughs> and in hey, Upper Mackenzie, baby, baby steps, man. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Fair enough. There actually is a better town say yes Upper and McKenzie. not but no. All right. Next. All right. In 2005, a Stanford medical team revealed in a study that subjects who consumed one cup of espresso per day improved their memory. Two cups of espresso per day lowered their risk of developing Alzheimer's. And subjects who consumed three cups of espresso per day, those... Uh, those <laughs> Those subjects, they drank cups and sliced the world in half with their laser eyes. So, uh, sounds like you hit a tropo. Well, there was a diarrhea Sorry. joke coming. Is this that a new was, form of comedy for you, Matt? <laughs> oh, are you trying to play? Are you trying to act out I'm, here? I, I, feel I feel like I think I'm I like Matt's it. hits. Oh man, I did. He's I'm still got a vast it, it was, repertoire. Yeah, I like it. It's a little bit of sketch comedy i'm I'm digging it thanks it's it's it's, it's scaring me that how many more characters right you, have? Now. you guys are so full of yeah. shit actually a, a lot of our audio listeners <laughs> so have asked for matt to do his segment in mime <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can do that all right finish strong i'm pulling well, for I got you two more forget in these 2015, jokers <laughs> in, t- in 2015 <laughs> this happened in 2015 pantomime actually <laughs> it's the hardest i've ever seen sean laugh oh my god <laughs> That's During awesome. my piece, which is well, I just asked him news. to donate to my campaign. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> That's when he started laughing. All right. In 2015, Lithuania was the last <laughs> to adopt the euro because if they didn't, Angelina Jolie was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. And finally. Oh, that was. Oh, finally, that wasn't. It. Oh, man. Yeah, come on. You should have gone 19, on a high note. 19 year old Norwegian Magnus Carlson. Becomes the youngest number one ranked chess player in the world. Years later, now happily married, the chess champ is an engineer and his wife, Astrid, is a sex doll. They now live in Blue Ball, Pennsylvania. (laughs) ML's trying not to laugh, but he's actually laughing at it. No, I'm I'm laughing because I think I remember the conversation where I said... Don't 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 go with the chess. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>or new theme <laughs> no just let me ask real quick <laughs> you have you have conversations so you actually had a conversation about this this bit uh, no, no Matt, do you remember <laughs> no, 
I I just no, love I, I just love how the drowning man grabbed an anchor with Blue Balls Pennsylvania at the what, end. What a um, other people would look for something that floated. Yeah, nice mentoring. <laughs> Oh, I try, and then sometimes I don't. Uh Uh-oh, COVID. So, Matt, he told you not to use that? No, I think there was another one. There was another one we we 86. Well, I give him like a list of 10 or 12 jokes, and he'll sit there and go, no, no, no. And then he'll look at the ones that he threw on the floor and go, okay, those are it. So I guess I'll just pick these up and pick four. Four. That's that's how it happens. I'll just say Matt may give me 10 or 12 things that – have joked on the top of the page, and, and then we we try and <laughs> just being, we try and salvage something. Why are you being so mean to Matt today? It's oh, not yeah, funny. Okay, okay it's not pot. funny. My God, Those were you good. Too. I liked it. Did you say okay, pot? Yeah, I love Matt. Ah, uh, so I love um, Sean. just not a segment. No, he's not funny, but that's okay. I love Matt. <sighs> oh, There's lots of time to keep. I love that you, Sean. Thank you. That's a nice guy. So, uh, Room 7609, we had so many great new wave holiday tunes that uh, we still can't figure out why not even one of them has slipped on to 100.3 WNIC, the home of Christmas music from Easter until, uh, until uh, I think, pretty much until Easter. You know, but- it's funny. I, I had that station on in my car because I had the kids in the car and they liked Christmas music. And then I got in the other day. I'm like, why is this terrible song on in my car? And I realized they're done with Christmas music. Oh. I'm back to the usual problem. Damn. Uh, yeah. My, well, I don't listen. I mean, I'm not their demographic, so. No, no. It's uh, it, it's it's tough. It's very tough. That's Who is why, your demographic? That's why people should use their Mark. time podcasting. Listen to podcasts. Um, I was ever targeted at uh, males 25 to 54. Okay. 25. Nice. To 54. <laughs> It's a it's a wide band, but uh, we we played uh, the shit out of new wave holiday tunes, including our last episode, which is exclusively new wave holiday music. So if you missed that, go back and, and check it out. And the episode before that, we had Santa Claus, which I know is oh sort of God. is sort of a seasonal uh, show. But I'm I'll tell scared. you what, that one stands up. There was some there was some some crazy stuff in there. So we appreciate uh, we appreciated Santa for dropping in since. You know, nobody wants them around. But we're getting back to the underappreciated new wave gems. And nothing better to start with than Martha and the Muffins, who take a little trip to Echo Beach. Thank you. 
Not bad. So that band should actually be called Martha's and the Muffins because, believe it or not, there are two women in the band named Martha, and it's not a gimmick. They were both named Martha. They had a Martha. They got another Martha. And so you got two Marthas, uh, one of whom is uh, still pretty. All right, please educate me. I know nothing about that band. So they are a Canadian new wave band. Um, There is no Echo Beach. What? Although the band Fake members, news. the band members claim that since this became a big hit, it was it did it got some national play. It was they toured the world, but they have since they claim that people have since sent them things like, "Oh, I remember Echo Beach. Or, I love Echo Beach." Yeah. It's like, yeah, I don't think so. But uh, the guy who wrote the song said there is no Echo Beach, at least not the one that uh, that you may be thinking of, uh, Echo Beach bums, but. Not a big band. They were not around for a long time. But that is a classic New Wave tune. Again, we talked a little bit about this uh, in one of our previous shows. New Wave does not have to be synth. Often New Wave has a great danceable beat. You'll have some horns. Sometimes you'll have a a, a heavy bass uh, presence. And that's just, that's a tune. It pops up on my YouTube playlist all the time. And I will listen to it over and over again because it, to me, is the epitome of New Wave cool pop music yeah i like it It was also named uh by cbc radio the number 35 um all-time canadian band song the other 34 songs were by april wine so that list is not quite as hard to crack as as you might think and i think there might have been a tune from chilliwack in the top 35 (laughs) um no nickelback though I actually don't yeah, know anything about Nickelback. I don't, why does everybody uh, hate Nickelback? Is that just like a oh, gag? Because they're overplayed and they're they? kind okay. of... Um, like I, not metal? Uh, maybe metal? a little um, cliche in a way with lyrics and sound. A, a metal band is cliche? I, uh, wait, they're not metal. Or nickel? Metal? Nickelback? It's a metal, isn't metal? it? It's oh. a it was a nice song. Okay, what's the next thing? <laughs> so, so yes. So we, uh, you know, we've we've been doing this for about two years now. And we've found all kinds of great new wave tunes that maybe people had forgotten or didn't know, or maybe it was a B side. We always love to get your nominations for new wave classics um, and bands that maybe you didn't know before. This one kind of was a, a a double. Daily Double, we had a band people didn't really know and a tune they might not have known that were both awesome. And we did have somebody who heard me mention Martha and the Muffins earlier say, you know what, uh, I love Martha and the Muffins, but don't play Echo Beach. Oh, and oh, man of the people, there you are. So I did listen to another one. Oh, it has been. It's a constituent. I, I did listen to another Martha and the Muffins <laughs> tune, and I said, no, Echo Beach is their best one. Way to listen to constituents. Yeah, thank you. Your, your constituent is important. I ain't been elected to nothing yet. <laughs> so um, so there's there's Room 7609. Of course, if you love Room 7609, there's no better way to show it than with a super groovy Room 7609 vintage keychain available at the Drew and Mike store. Dot com. I don't know how we did over Christmas, but I hope we, I hope we move some merch. And I don't just say that because I'm about to be unemployed. Actually, that's exactly why I say that because I'm about to be unemployed. Um, but we have some help from the kind people who listen to this show. And big ups to Alberto, who was very generous. Dave and Kristen, who never lets us down. And John, who sent a fin along with this note. Hey, ML, it is truly a Christmas miracle that you mentioned the fall and rise of Reginald Perrin and Haircut 100 in the same show. Here's a token of my appreciation for your show. Based on the token, not a lot of appreciation, but good luck on your new adventures in 2021. So, uh, well, I appreciate it. So, thank you, John. Sean does too, maybe. I don't know. Of if course. you've never seen, so Sean and I were talking about British television. If you've never seen the fall and rise of Reginald Perrin, it is one of the funniest shows ever because it's about a going nowhere uh, middle-level manager who decides to throw his whole life away and then as he starts over again he basically recreates his life it is one of the funniest most ironic shows ever and it is it's outstanding when was it made in the 70s of course of course (laughs) it just drives me i just cannot figure it out but it's very good stuff. You, um, you don't watch any TV from the 90s or, uh, or more recent. Another What's, great British spy show, The Sandbaggers. But, uh, but yeah, that's, for the sideburns alone, it's worth a watch. Um, and the lapels. <laughs> but, uh, but so, yes, so we, uh, we really appreciate that. And I, I should suggest to you that there's another cause that's worth donating to. Maybe the old 
ML for City Council fund. If you are so inclined to Is throw that legal? A, yeah, you haven't even a few mentioned bones that. my way, we will have a link on our website for how you can support the campaign, which uh, we hope you will. There's all kinds of ways to support this crazy endeavor. Uh, I don't think it's so crazy, by the way. I think, I think no, it's, I, I, we, we might poke fun and, and laugh at it. And I'm still just crazy it's enough. It's kind of that exciting. It I just want to know if Mark and I are not going to get paid anymore now that you have a different fund to fill. Well, uh, you can donate to both. Let's they're just not, put it this way: uh, I ain't embezzled before, I ain't embezzling now, and I ain't embezz- embezzling ever. So uh, I think you're going to do a hell of a job uh, so. when you win, and oh, you'll be I, expected. I like to, that attitude. You'll be I know, expected so serious. You to know talk that. about yourself. That's the best part. You know that. I give you you'll, me be liber- shit. you'll be liberated. I think it's a good decision. It'll be awesome. Yeah. I will try and, and talk about I'll talk about things that matter. And I'll we'll see if you actually shave. That's it's about time too. Yeah. Well, since Manscaped, it looks like we'll no longer be a sponsor. <laughs> uh, uh speaking of which, we will be getting you details soon on those of you who were kind enough to make Manscaped purchases using promo code ML. We will be getting you an invitation, I'd say sometime in January to the special show where you can be here from the beginning to the end and wonder what the hell we're doing in the middle. You can see how this goes so very, very wrong from the very, very start. But, Mark, if people want to give to the show, ML yeah. Soul of Detroit, how do they how do they open their hearts and their wallets? Uh, there's a little link right on mlsoulofdetroit.com. We'll open up your uh, PayPal Me page and you can uh, give into your broke. So open your heart, open your wallet, <laughs> open your browser and make a donation, which is generously spread amongst the entire crew here. So, And the books are audited, so you know that that's most likely true. And you can also, of course, help the show, and this is one of the most important things, by contacting our sponsors and letting them know that you appreciate their sponsorship of this show and that you contacted them because you learned about them from our show, and that way they know they're not wasting their money by giving it to us. So... Please, uh, please spread the good word about the soul of Detroit. Uh, you can also support us by buying hoodies, long sleeve T-shirts, and beanies. Uh, the beanies will keep your dome warm in the cold. And we have plenty of deals on masks, gaiters, those keychains, T-shirts, hockey jerseys, stickers, signed copies of the Kwame Sutra, and even some of the coolest neon clocks you've ever seen. You can find all that at DrewAndMikeStore.com. Uh, we certainly appreciate when you subscribe to the show, when you share the show, when you rate the show. And if it's not asking too much, could you show us a little love, too? Just just a little. I got to say, um, you asked me to look at some of the comments on the Facebook Live so far today. I'm very, very positive. People are supporting you. They're behind you. They like this decision as well. So that'll make you feel good for about 10 minutes. It'll make me feel better when they load up that campaign account so I can... Uh... <laughs> Oh, you already already sound like a politician. I know that's nice. <laughs> you know, th- so I, I do have a little practice asking people for money because of my fundraising for Clark Park. But oh, I that, thought you were going to say because of this. That has been oh, there's this too, but Endeavor. but that is very uncomfortable for me to ask people for money, and I think one of the hardest things for me to do is to ask people for money. That's already hard for me to do, but to ask people for money that will be used for my benefit to further my ambitions as a candidate. That just feels very uncomfortable asking people to give me money but uh they tell me i better get over it i better get over it fast so uh um, couple, so this is good practice a couple questions on here one wants to know is spivey your opponent for that district is that what it, is that who your opponent is so i'm not running against anybody i'm running for something okay. andre spivey is currently also, the wow, councilman what, a, what, a, what an answer that's right uh <laughs> Spi- Spi- spivey is currently the councilman in district four um he has not made a declaration as to whether or not he's going to run or not, but but you know what? Uh, to me, if I didn't think I was not the best person for the job, I wouldn't be running. So I, I don't care who else wants this job. I know I can do it. I believe I can do it better than anybody else, and I hope people give me a chance to prove that. And then someone else asked, does Duggan endorse um, people running for city council? Is that a thing he does? So endorsements are always a tricky thing, uh, politicians are often reluctant to endorse in a race where there's an incumbent uh, if they're all of the same party. These are, of course, nonpartisan elections, which I love. So I'm neither a Democrat or Republican. I'm just someone who wants to serve everybody. Um, But 
sometimes politicians don't endorse because they're running for election themselves. Mike Duggan is running for re-election. As you know, he's on this show. He, he's on here. He wants your vote. So whether he's going to uh, support any other candidates or not, I don't know. Again, I don't care. Uh, I didn't ask anybody for permission to run. I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to say or what to do. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think we'd like the support of everybody in Detroit. Uh, he's got a nice house on the river. They call it the Manoogian Mansion. If I'm going to get, well, I guess I'm not running. He's not in my district. So I guess I don't, I wouldn't get his vote. But, um, but the, the, the endorsement I need is from the people in the district for, because they're the ones who cast the votes account. And they're the ones who are going to hold me accountable if I am elected. And they're the ones who are going to say, you know what? You said you were great. Turns out you're not. Beat it. And the well, other the other good comment is that um, someone just wrote that they would rather vote for Sean. <laughs> so. oh. Really? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Well, you run I, for, have, uh, I, have, City I have nothing to offer. You want to run for Ann Arbor City Council? Are you in the city limits? I'm a, a, a amoeba. A what? I'm a, I'm a couple amoeba? of cells, a blob, <laughs> a piece of lint. Oh, my goodness. That's me. So hard on yourself. Yeah, man. don't worry. Boy, I thought I was. Oh, please vote for Mike. I thought I, I, <laughs> I thought my modesty was false. Uh, I can't. I can't wait to see the change in this man over the next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What kind of change? How, how would you fit all that on a bumper sticker, Sean? I'm just an amoeba. I'm just a fleck of. I mean, I'm a. I'm a dead skin cell out of carpet. I'm a <laughs> vote for Sean. I, uh, I'm a mote in God's yeah, I, eye. I have. I have my days. Here's what I want to know: when we when we convene, I don't think you could fit that bumper sticker on the back of Matt's truck. Will you wear um or a something a little different next week? Will you come in in a speedo? Maybe. <laughs> speedo. I'd like to see that. I want you to step out, announce yourself. Like, get out there. If Michael Dukakis got in trouble for wearing a helmet when he was driving in a tank, which is perfectly appropriate uh, How about a Richard outerwear. Simmons style outfit? Loose, tight. Well, that's a contradiction. Sorry. Short, <laughs> tight shorts, you know, athletic shorts, the little nylon sort of vaguely see through. So, and a tank top to expose your chest hair. Just because I think there was some confusion. When I, when I asked people to show us a little love, I was referring to the listeners, not to my creepy cousin across the table here. <laughs> uh, six feet, of course, socially distanced, very responsible here at Red Shovel Network. We keep the protocols. Uh, and you can keep wearing your baseball cap, too, as a politician now, because it's become, uh, you know, vogue. Well, we're thinking that the... Uh, we're thinking that uh, we might have some campaign gear. So we'll have hey, to, all right. So I may be freshening up my wardrobe, but um, but before we go, uh, obviously a lot of this is about the people speaking. You know, we believe in that. We believe in that here. And Dave writes, Sean, I would love to shake your hand someday, if only to see what kind of claw you have that allows you to underhand the TP. <laughs> Overhand all day, <laughs> but that's what I said. I like pulling it from the top, not the bottom. Yeah. So Dave, we're so gonna... was it? Was I not clear about what that kind of claw? You have? I don't understand. I'm confused. Well, that's a visual I don't really need. He was as appalled. <laughs> he was as appalled as you were. So uh, Dave, you may want to review that tape to make sure. That I mean, may, maybe that. I maybe I misspoke. It's possible. It's, it's... No, I remember you saying it over overhand over. Maybe, yeah, maybe I I could be wrong. It's mm-hmm. frequent. The frightening visuals continue. Kyle from Flint <laughs> in Vase. ML, I love everything about in you vase. except your deep rooted dis. I was waiting how long I'd in get before. Vase. What a dick. I, I thought I might I thought I, I might I, get I, to the first comma. Oh, no, I mean on purpose now. <laughs> of course he is. God <laughs> Damn, I I've invaded that you're well, okay. What did Actually, Ky- I, what did Kyle invade? I, I think I got through the first clause, but I did, did you not say get don't to be a the dick? first period. Um ML, I love everything about you, Kyle Invase, except <laughs> your deep-rooted disdain of Benny Hill. Oh, wow. Please be more like Mr. Windsor. Watch the Benny Hill Hospital skit. If you don't like it, well, please keep it to yourself. To err is human, to forgive is divine. Don't hate the sinner, hate the sin. Keep up the good work, and it's okay to lie about Benny Hill. I mean, your audience has at least four score of Benny Hill fans. That's 80 people of the millions that regularly listen. I mean, yakety sex, by far the best part of it. This is why Mark is the best, that you had that ready to go. Drew would be proud. (laughs) Like I said, I learned. Is that Alto Reed? Is that some of his early solo work? Is this a full circle now? Is this a studio gig that he had? So I Can you imagine that show today? I don't like Benny Hill, but I do like some of his, his jogging partners. Um, what? 
he used to. I know what you meant. He used to run around. The same I, thing I, Sean meant, but in a very different fashion. Yeah. No, that old guy. I, I, oh, I, yeah, okay, I, yeah. I'm a sure. big supporter of geriatric fitness. I think it's <laughs> crucial to keep your mind and body sharp. Imagine so, though having a show today about oh, we like breasts. Men like breasts. Yeah, it's called it's that show's called Instagram. I, I yeah, think right. That right. show's called The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. Yeah, it's still out there. Grey's it's Anatomy. Just a little, is it more classed uh, up? Or, no, oh. you have to pretend that you don't like it. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, um, Grey's Anatomy. Jeez, I was watching. What? Teresa was watching this show called a, a, a Million Little Things or something. I can't. I, I don't remember what it is, but it, uh, it starts off with. Uh, with Ron Livingston from The Office commit suicide, which just tells me that he saw the scripts. So I I, uh, I like Ron, but what an awful show. And the friends on this show, everybody's so sweet and understanding, and they're always around to hug each other. And I That's watched terrible. it in the few hours this week that I wasn't trying to wrap up things at the free press or get other stuff done. And I just looked at Teresa and I said, if we had friends like this, I would be so <laughs> unhappy. I would hate them. You know, I, I mean, well, it just, uh, it's just a, so. Plus it's a new show. I mean. You know, there's a right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's post uh, 1980. But you know, there's a writer's room where they're all sitting around saying, and what about after this happens? So, okay, so he died, but they all come together and this guy survived cancer. Well, how about if this guy gets hit by a car? It sounds and, like uh, that this is us thing, but people like it, I guess. I don't know. Oh, man. I'll just tell you what. I, I feel blessed. I don't get it. To have a lot of friends, but I'm glad that we don't show up on my front lawn every day to yeah. talk about um, some card that somebody wrote us 42 years ago that we found under. Ugh, please. But yeah. if you live in his district and you had a problem, go ahead and show up on his front lawn. There are a million little things I, I hope to make better about District 4, but uh, TV oh. viewing is is... He's beyond my Sean, he is smooth. Is beyond my realm. That's so, never really a word I've associated with him. But uh, uh, he's, uh, come on, man, he's, he's clever. He's so we we uh, we pimped Sean's stuff pretty good today. But anything we should be looking for in the free press? Obviously, there's the great Adam Fox profile coming. My final piece of journalism, yeah. perhaps ever. So you yeah, want to look yeah, yeah. We'll and look. Please for that. subscribe. But Sean, what's what's cooking? You you uh, you got the Harbaugh deal nailed down? Yeah, Who's the kinda, coach kinda, of the Lions? Kind of waiting. Who's, Waiting on that. Yeah, we'll see what's going on with the Lions. The Pistons are losing, but sort of kind of gathering a little bit. I of think your most interesting columns inter have been the disaster in East Lansing basketball. What? Yeah, no, they're... Uh, that has been really fascinating. They're a mess. Watch. Michigan, on the other hand, is uh, Michigan Ooh. basketball has been great. So we have... Yeah, they're playing this week. I'm going to write about them. Uh, I think it's kind of fun that the Pistons are gathering a little bit of interest right now, despite the losing, because they're they're young and they're playing with a certain kind of to use a mic word, effervescence, you know, bubbly, that like you, uh, slushy, like you, like your uh, Altus. But they're all new, right? I mean, other they than are, and they Blake play, Griffin, and they play, their, and they play their asses off, and that's these endearing. guys weren't even on the same team two months ago. That's what's amazing. All right, quick fire sports questions, just a couple. Yes, sir. Will they be a playoff team, Pistons? No. In the Eastern uh, Conference, will, you don't no, think so? No, no. Will Harbaugh be at Michigan? Mm, yes. Will that happen in the next day or two? No, really? Well, that, I think they got to wait. Stupid. They got to wait for the NFL. Maybe, maybe next. That's ridiculous. Maybe the next few days. Just be done with them. So it looks like the Lions well, will not hire Urban Meyer, but should they? I think anybody that can hire Urban Meyer should. I don't know. I mean, he's a college coach. So Saban, greatest college coach ever. Terrible pro coach. Well, I don't know about terrible. He didn't have the talent, but he had Joey Harrington, right? In Miami. In Miami, I don't yeah, think did. so. Do yeah, you know? he did. He had uh, Dante Culpepper too, and he was quite the dick to him. Oh, he was, yeah. So I don't. I have no that. idea if Urban Meyer will be a good coach in the NFL. But by the way, this is not a sports Shh. podcast. No, I, I just wanted the. It's a we, political. Okay. <laughs> it is now. It's yeah, a city will, council. Will Matthew Stafford be a lion next year? Because you wrote about that too. I did. Uh, I don't know. I by know. the way, probably Adam Fox does not like Madam Matthew Stafford. Really? Is that one of the pieces you found out? That's a little tidbit, just a little sneak preview, just a tease. Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. Did you say yes, he will, or he won't? I I think he probably will. I mean, the smart, you know, why? why I mean, if they can get a great trade package, so, then, then go for it. But So basically, all those questions, the more things change, the more they'll stay exactly the same. Stafford will be here. Harbaugh will be in Ann Arbor. And well, it's just a, a, it's a, team. It's a, I mean, I guess if they could get a good trade, but it, will Michigan State get one of the. Uh, that's on the cap hit. Will Michigan State get one of the buys in the Big Ten basketball tournament, meaning top four finish? No. Not now. 
Okay. Uh, no, no, no. I don't know. They tried the, to give that Nebraska the, game Izzo's away. Izzo's got like a 20 some odd year streak of making the tournament. That might be in jeopardy this year. You know what I learned? Do you this think year? it will? Duke sucks. Oh, they're, yeah, Duke's they're not terrible. very good at all. Yeah, doesn't, do they I think what? either. Do I think that they'll make, miss yeah, the what, tournament? Will they miss the tournament? There's an absolute chance because the Big Ten is deep and, uh, but and, Mich- still, and Michigan State doesn't sec. have a point guard. Well, wait a sec. They're still blue blood, and they're still ranked in the AP. They don't have a big guy. They don't have rim protection, and there's you know they may now have a freshman point guard, but they're just disorganized. They might be able to figure it out. He's had a couple of years where he's it's been close. Cassius Winston's freshman year, that team squeaked into the tournament. Well, hell, it's almost the month of Izzo, so you better, know you better figure it out. He so he has a year like this every few years where it's just you know, but he typically figures it out. Yeah, to get into the tournament and yeah. and then lose the first game or maybe win one game. And- that's an interesting story. Sorry, ML. No, that's okay. Sorry, we didn't we didn't talk about you for a bit. Do are Michigan fans uh, happy? So hurtful that their team's so good and Michigan State struggling. Is this kind of like you've, oh, just given, I, you've given up on football completely? Um. Well, I mean, Michigan football is a total utter disaster right okay, now. Okay, let me ask you I, one. I, quick. As far as Michigan State basketball, I'd rather I, honestly, and you guys probably won't believe it. I wish they were better than what they were. I wish they were, you know, top five right now. To tell you the truth, because if you're going to beat them, I'd rather beat them when they are good. And they, and you know, I, I don't have anything against Izzo. I like him. He's a good coach. Um, but I don't I don't weigh what Michigan does versus what they do. That well, Michigan team's fun to watch. That's they are fun to watch. They're good. Let me ask you a quick question. You watch the Ohio State Clemson game, the national oh, yeah. semifinal. Yep. When you watch Ohio State play as a Michigan fan, and what do you think? Oh, different level. But Clemson's a different level. Alabama's a different level than everybody else in their well, of course. But conference. I mean, is it tougher that it's Ohio State and they just seem to be? I, I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> I grew just, up a Buckeye fan. They don't bother me as much as okay. So you're not really a Michigan fan. No, I am. It's I'm all a gra- I'm, a, I'm a graduate. I just grew up the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah, what are you eating again? Is it more He's carrots? Down on carrots again. Uh, celery. All right. Okay. Take us home then, honey. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So um uh thank you everybody for your kind attention. I want to say God bless America. God bless the people of District Four. God bless the city of Detroit. God bless Sean. God bless Sean. Thank you. We we love everybody despite their flaws. Thank and you. if you have some spare time, please listen to our other Red Shovel Network shows. That's Charlie LaDuff's No BS News Hour, No Vilter Sports with Eli, Denny, and Bob, and the Drew and Mike podcast. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Elric or on Facebook, ML, no periods, Elric. And uh, on Instagram, I think I'm ML underscore Elric. But uh, we really appreciate you listening. We uh, look forward to a pretty crazy 2021. And we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So thanks for sticking with us. And please, spread the word. And now it's time for our friend Cyrus to take us out. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? The Play Tonight, as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Mark Fellauer. Written by Sean Winsor. And scored by M.L. Elric. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama... The life of M.L. Elric. This is the Red Shovel Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>